So, hello, welcome to the uh, another go seminar today. Uh, speaker is Paul Patak, and he will talk about shareability. The floor is yours. Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And today I will speak about my favorite topic, and that's basically what happens with graphs if we increase their dimension. Yeah, and just to be clear, for me, a graph is just a collection of edges. Yeah? And now we will somehow speak what happens if we replace the edges by triangles. Okay. And more precisely, today I will speak about shellability. And I will try to convince you that shellability is to some extent something like the higher dimensional analog of planar connected graphs. Okay. So now a brief overview of my talk. In the first part, I will say you start with the motivation and see what happens in planar graphs. And then we will move to simplicial polytops, which are the higher general analogs of planar graphs to some extent. And then we will say something about the general setting for general simplicial complexes, what's known there, what's not. And finally, we will speak about the hardness status of this new notion of this shellability. Okay, so that's the brief overview of what I'm talking about today. Okay. So let me start with planar connected graphs. And there probably the most fundamental result is Euler's formula. I hope all of you are familiar with it, but let me, for the, uh, for the purposes, mention how it is proved. So for me, graph is a collection of edges. So if I have a connected graph, I can build it by starting, by starting with a single edge. And what does this edge produce? Well, this edge has two vertices. It has one edge, and there in the plane, we have one face, right? So, and in total, if I count the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces, I obtain two. And then I want to produce a connected graph and maintain the connectivity throughout my construction. So if I add another edge, I need to glue this edge to the thing I have already constructed, yes? So now I glue another edge, yeah? The blue color here stands for new things, yeah? So I glue this new edge by one vertex to the previous thing, yeah? And what, ha what happens here? Well, I edit one vertex, I edit one edge and didn't change the number of vertices. So I add another edge, again, no change. And then I have the second type of edge I can glue there. I can glue the edge by two vertices. And what does this do? Well, it adds one edge. It doesn't add any vertex, but it adds a new face. Well, of course, this is non-trivial to prove exactly, right? You need to Jordan cost curve theorem for that, but more or less, this is the moral of the story, and this is the proof of the Euler formula for graphs. And let me also mention some of the consequences what we have for planar graphs for this. So do you know some of the consequences of Euler's formula? Okay, so let me mention just a few of them. First of all, we can use Euler's formula to bound the number of edges of planar graphs, number of, in terms of vertices. And Using this, we can, for example, show that the complete graph on five vertices is not planar, right? So how do we do that? Yeah, just a quick, quick recapitulation. So this K5 has, right, 10 edges, five choose two, and five vertices. Now, if I have a face, this face is bounded by at least three edges, but you know each edge has two sides, so it's bounded just by one side of the edge, either by left or right. 
So each edge, each face has at least three of these edge sides. And therefore, the number of the total number of faces is at most 20 divided by 3. The 20 is because we have 20 edge sides, right? So it's 6. Well, and if we plug this into the Euler formula, what we get? The number of vertices is 5, the number of edges is 10, and the number of faces is at most 6. Therefore, we get at most 1. And this is smaller than 2 and contradicts Euler formula. Therefore, this graph is not, not planar. Similarly, we have the non planarity of the other things. Here, are just mentioned, here it's just one difference. And here, because K33 is a bipartite graph, it doesn't contain triangles. Therefore, each side, each face has at least four edge sides. Yeah? We do not have triangles in our graph, so we need to have at least four edge sides. And therefore, we can do the same calculation as before and obtain the non planarity of case DC. And another, let's say, uh, consequence of Euler formula is that if I have a planar triangulation which has a vertices, then these triangulations, in these triangulations, I exactly know the number of edges and the number of triangular faces. So, and so, and there are many more consequences, but I don't want to go into that. And we see what from this can be carried over to higher dimensions. So, but before, let me introduce some terminology. We have seen that when we produce the graph, when we build the graph, we basically encountered three types of edges. Either the, the original edge, the first one, which was well, which wasn't glued by any vertex to the previous one. So it's glued by zero vertex. And be because of that, the number of such edges is denoted H0. Then we have edge which is glued by one vertex. And the number of such edges shall be denoted H1, because they are glued by one vertex. And finally, there were, there were edges which were glued by two vertices. And the number of these edges shall be denoted by H2. And now, what is H1? Well, it's the original edge. There was only one there. So H1 is one. What's H1? H1 is the number of each edge of type H1 adds a vertex. And therefore, we started by two vertices. And therefore, the H1 equals the number of vertices minus two. And finally, what's the number of H2? Well, it's the number of faces minus one, minus the original. Each such face added a face, and there were no other face additions. So this number is the number of faces minus one. So here we see that these H numbers are completely determined by the number of faces and by the number of edges. And yeah, let's move to high dimension. So first, uh, we will replace the edges by higher dimensional analogs. And what are these analogs? Well, these are simplices. So let me just record what a d-dimensional simplex is. The d-dimensional simplex is simply a convex hull of d plus y, a finely independent points. Yeah, so the zero-dimensional simplex is point, vertex. A one-dimensional simplex is an edge. These are the things which are in graphs. A two-dimensional simplex is a triangle. A three-dimensional simplex is a tetrahedron. And uh, let's say four-dimensional simplex, which I didn't draw because my four-dimensional imagination and drawing skills are rather limited, is called pentachoron because it has five vertices. All right? So, and now we will speak about simplicial polytopes. And what are simplicial polytopes? Well, simplicial polytope, it's a polytope where each facet is a simplex of dimension one less. 
Okay, so it's an, a fine hull of some points living in Rd, where each phase is a simplex. For example, in three dimensions, one example is the tetrahedron, because each phase of the tetrahedron is a triangle. And here I have another simple polytop. Okay, you can look at it. So it's um, icosahedron. It has 20 triangular faces. They are even labeled on that model. <laughs> and why do we care about simple polytops? So, well, well uh, they appear in convex optimization mostly. Because if I have some general bunch of linear inequalities, then unless these inequalities are some, to some extent degenerate, yeah. Yeah, then I will have mostly triangular faces. Or unless the point, the point yeah. configuration is to some extent degenerate, most of the faces will be really uh, simple, yeah. simplices. Yeah. If I would have, uh, let's say, a square, that would mean that four of the points have to lie in the same. So, so, and for this reason, we care about simplicial polytops. And simplicial polytops, in some sense, are the most complicated among the polytops. They have the maximum number of faces and stuff like that. So, uh, understanding simplicial polytops is really interesting. For, and has applications in linear programming in convex optimization, yeah, because you usually get some nice polytops, and among the polytops, the simplest ones are sometimes the hardest to crack. So, and this doesn't only concern uh, simplex method, but also other ways how to attack, uh, how to attack these problems. But this understanding of polytops has even many interesting connections to other parts of mathematics. And here I just mentioned some buzzwords. No worry if you do not know what that means. They found applications in commutative algebra by so-called Stanley Reisner rings. They uh, have uh, applications in group theory. For example, you can study the order complexes of Bruhat's orders and stuff like that. So no worry. And let me now show you what we can say about the simplest polytops. So if K is a simplest polytop, let Fi denote the number of i-dimensional phases. And V, yeah, so F0 is the number of vertices, F1 is the number of edges, F2 is the number of triangles, and so on. So and now we, have, we would like to have the Euler's formula. And the Euler's formula in this generality has the following form, which you can see on the slide. And originally, this was proved by Schleffle in mid 19th century, in 1852. However, the proof contained a gap, a serious gap at that point. And Schleffle namely assumed shellability. And shellability means that the boundary of the polytope can be uh, glued as we glued the graph before. And here, what I mean glued, for example, if the boundary consists of triangles, I start with a simple triangle, and then what I am allowed is to glue the next triangle along, along one edge, two edges, or three edges. What I cannot do is I cannot do the next triangle by a single vertex. You know, I have my puzzle pieces and the gluing two puzzle pieces by just the vertex, it simply doesn't hold. Similarly, I cannot use glue by two vertices or three vertices or by an edge and the vertex opposite to that edge. Yeah? So this is not allowed. And I only have these two, these four possibilities denoted by the number of edges along which I grew, H0, H1, H2, and H3. And Schleffle assumed that you can always glue the boundary of that polytope in this fashion, even in higher dimension, when I guess the higher dimensional analog is obvious 
You can glue the tetrahedra just by the triangles. Well, and to patch this gap, Poincaré actually invented algebraic topology. Yeah? So, but that's a serious overkill, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, it turned out to be quite useful. And actually, but uh, Poincaré only patched the gap in showing that the Euler's formula actually holds for arbitrarily simple complexes or even general complexes. However, so let me now go back a bit. And today uh, I, I will find the relation among the F numbers and H numbers. Because so far, we can think that, you know, the H numbers depend on the way in which we glue these things together, right? We started with some edge, then glue something, then glue the next edge, then glue the next edge. Yeah. So, and it may happen that in some ordering, the number of edges that, that were glued by two, were, uh, two, two edges was different than in some other ordering, right? Is it imaginable? Well, but so let HI be the number of faces which were glued by I edges. And let FI be the number of faces of dimension I. So now I claim that these H numbers completely determine the number of faces. This is more or less clear, right? Because if I have this H zero, so what does this H zero add? Well, it adds one, it adds one empty phase, a phase of dimension minus one. It's a triangle now, right? It has three vertices, it has three edges, and it has one triangle. So this is the number of things I've added by this H one, uh, H zero. What about H1? If I glue the triangle along one edge, well, then I add the opposite vertex, two edges, and one triangle. And you can see here, see it here, for example, on the triangle number two. When I glue the two, I add this, edge, this vertex, these two edges, and the whole triangle. So here again, then what about the triangle? which I glue by two edges. Well, for example, the five here. Well, I see I only add one edge and one triangle. So this is this. And finally, if I glue something by all three edges, I only add the triangle. So, and if you look at this transformation, which to this H vectors, this H number assigns these F numbers, then you see, that it's a lower triangular matrix with, that, with one on diagonal. Therefore, this matrix is inverted, invertible. And you can actually compute the inverse. And there will be some whole numbers here, which look somehow strange. But look here. This is almost the Euler formula, right, for this H3. If we somehow could prove that H3 is always one. So, and now we move to general simple complexes, right? To see that this is not trivial and that really we need some proof to show that these boundaries of simple polytopes are shallable, that we can find this ordering this gluing of faces. So, so for H3, you already have all the three edges, but just the, the face is missing. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have the, 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 the surface. With yes, the yes, yes. For example, if I have the boundary of the tetrahedron, then I just glue this three on the top and then I yeah, fill the gap below. <laughs> or, okay, so now a quick test. Here I have several simple complexes consisting of triangles. So what do you think? Which of them are shallable? For which we can find this nice gluing procedure and for which not? So 
Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so what for the dolphin? Yeah. Probably yes. Probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends how how exactly it looks from the opposite side, right? Uh -huh. And for for this, we cannot. And the reason is that somehow we can we need to go around, right? So let's say I start here: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eight, eight. But at some point, I need to close the circle. And how can I do it? Well, either I glue a triangle by two vertices like here, and this is not allowed. Or the second possibility is I glue it this, and this is also not allowed. Yeah, so these two are out of question. Yeah. So, and this, by the way, says that if I have some nice simplicial complex, which has this nice shellability property, which is shellable, then the homology can only appear in the top dimension. But, okay, so, and now back to the story of simple polytopes. In year 1972, Brugesser and Mani finally proved, yeah, that's 120 years after original Schleffle proof, they proved that polytopes, the boundaries of polytopes are always shallable. And they called their proof a balloon flight. Basically, what happens is you take your, uh, your polytope, you sit in one of the faces and you uh, in a balloon, and then you just go up. And you just, you know, uh, look at the faces which you see, and if a new face appears, you add it, you glue it to your things. And then, uh, yeah, so here, if you see, you basically start sitting in this, on this edge one, go up, then you start after you pass this line, which prolongs the edge two, you start seeing the phase two, then after you start seeing edge three, and then you come from below and you start, uh, now you see everything from the bottom, but you now, uh, somehow look at which face disappears yeah or you can say it as follows you basically uh, find a linear function or linear form on your vector space where, where you live such that no two points have the same height and then you order the faces according to which point is the lowest and this is a shelling and on the other hand, you also see that you can reverse the direction. Yeah? And this gives you a shelling in the reverse order. But what happens now? If you originally glue a triangle along two edges, now you glue the triangle along the missing edges, right? along the edges which are not there in this reverse order. And that means that reverse order is also a shelling in this proof. And this also means that the number of faces which were glued by, let's say, three edges is the same as the number of, of triangles that were glued by zero edges. And the number of triangles that were glued by one edge is the same as the number of triangles that were glued by two edges. Yeah. And these are the famous Dan-Zomerville relations, which were originally proved by Dan for five-dimensional polytopes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And later, several years later, extended by Somerville to the full general case of arbitrary dimensions. Yeah. And let me mention that in linear programming, the number of dimensions is usually huge. It can be in, easily in hundreds. Yes. Five-dimensional polytopes mm -hmm. really do not cut it. So, and actually, this is a generalization of Euler's formula. So here, for example, if we work with triangles, then D is three, yeah, because we somehow triangulate plane, which is 
a sphere and sphere lives in its boundary of three dimensional ball, right? So, and also three because the triangle has three vertices. So now in this case, dimension is three, H zero is by definition one, also F minus one is by definition one. And as we have computed earlier, we have this nice formula for H three. Yeah. I can go back, but here, that's exactly the thing. And I hope you uh, manage to convince to yourself that this was the proper thing. And if you plug this in, we see that we exactly obtain Euler's formula. But here we have more equations. Yeah, so it's really generalization and it provides us with new equalities, which these higher dimensional polytops need to satisfy. And it can actually be shown that these are the only linear equations that there are for polytopes. Yeah, for the phase number of polytopes. And this is probably the nicest, nicest expression for them. Yeah, so it cannot get easier than that. Try to write it down in the F numbers. Yeah. And so now some consequences of this. So first of all, we have already seen that every planar triangulation has prescribed number of faces and edges, but in half dimension, this is not so. Yeah. If I start tiling the space with tetrahedra, then depending on the way I glue these things together, I may get the different number of edges, yeah, even if the number of vertices is prescribed. Yeah, so, um, and of course, for computational reasons, I would like to have some upper and lower bounds. What is the worst case? What is the maximum number of faces I can get? What is the lowest number of faces I can get? And using these H numbers, McMullen in 70s proved that the maximum number of faces is obtained by so-called cyclic polytope. Yeah? And in cyclic polytope, if I take uh, D half points, it will always be an H or a phase. So these things are called neighborly. Yeah. And on the other hand, for simplicial polytopes, the minimal number of faces is obtained by so-called stacked polytopes. And stacked polytopes are basically built as you start with a tetrahedron, and then you just put a vertex very close to one of your faces. Yeah. And then you, in this way, if you do the convex hull, you obtain a new uh, uh, polytope, and then you add vertex very close to one of the dead faces and so on. So in this way, you obtain the minimum number of faces in a triangulation, which is also nice, but on, only works for simplicial ones. Whereas the upper bound theorem holds for arbitrary uh, polytopes because the simplest polytopes have the maximal number of faces among all polytopes. If you have, a, let's say, square face, if you just move one of the points slightly, then you split this one square face into two triangular ones. So, okay. And so let me also mention that shallability has applications throughout the mathematics. Here are just some of the more interesting ones. Yeah, so of course uh, we have already seen polytop theo uh, theory where we can just do this inductive proofs, but more general, we can do things in PL topology where we have shellings of PL manifolds, but uh, what was also studied was shellability of partially ordered sets. Yeah. And here, this was uh, pioneered by Birner and Wax in 19s and allowed them to prove many enumerative properties of very of some interesting process, like the Bruhat's orders I was mentioning before. And then later on, the shelling was extended even further to arbitrary monoids. Yeah. And here we really see monoids as uh, generalizations of process in some sense. Okay. And this was, yeah, this was the 90s. Uh, and pioneered by Piva, Reiner, Sturmfels, and the like. Okay. 
So, and now, so if the shellability is such important notion, so what is the hardness status of this? So what do you think? So we already know that simply shell polytops, that's, that's easy. Every simple shell polytops is shellable and nicely. But what about simple shell complexes in general? So, so here you see it's obviously in an B, right? Because you can just try all the ways how to put your triangle after each other and see whether you glue them along edges or not. And you can test that hopefully in polynomial time. But is this shellability efficiently decidable? So what do you think? For the abstract, yeah, it's NP complete, true. <laughs> but for, at least in dimension two, nothing is lost. If I have a pseudo manifold, then I can actually test the shellability in linear time. So basically by greedy algorithm, I start and I glue and I'm guaranteed to succeed. Okay. So, and now uh, several years ago, we together with my co-authors, Goaok, uh, Zuzana Patakova, uh, Martin Tanzer and Ule Wagner, we have proven, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, prove that uh, uh, this is actually NP complete. And later on, the proof was to some extent simplified by Santa Maria, Galvis, and Woodruff. But the simplification consists we have some types of gadgets, and they basically produce the same gadgets, but with a fewer number of vertices. And uh, yeah, and uh, they also cast it in a slightly different language which uh, basically needed that they needed to redo all the tools which were previously present. And actually it's even NP complete to decide whether a given three dimensional contractible simply shell complex is shallow. Yeah. So here contractible means that you can continuously shrink it to a point. And the reason is that basically if you have your simple shell complex, you can just do a cone over it and it doesn't change whether it's shellable or not. But it's obviously contractible to that point. So it's really easy corollary. And now, nice thing. Uh, so high level overview of the proof for the NP completeness. So here we do a reduction from, uh, from three sat and we have our conjunctive normal form formula. And basically, we knew that the number of triangles, we go backwards. Instead of trying to gluing things, we remove the triangles from the backwards, right? Reverse order. We, and we know the number of the triangles which are glued by three edges, which we must remove. We know this number exactly. Is exactly the number of two dimensional holes in our complex. So here it's exactly the number of spheres we have. And we have a sphere for each variety. Therefore, the number of triangles we can remove originally is the number of variables. Yeah? And for each of these spheres, we can decide whether we remove the variable on, in the top hemisphere or in the bottom hemisphere. And that corresponds to whether we have chosen uh, for this variable the positive or negative assignment, yeah. true or false. So let's say that we remove top, 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 and bottom here. And that means that somehow we assign u to be true, y to be true, x to be true, and z to be false. And once we remove these things, we can remove the adjacent triangles because they somehow in the reverse order it's complete. If it's okay, if we glue them, yes. we can remove them as this. And then finally we remove okay. 
we remove this part, which somehow propagates the variable to clauses. And now closed gadget, so now original closed gadget looks like that. This was one building block of it. It's some kind of topo complicated topological space. Actually, it should be triangulated, so split into triangles in some nice way. And uh, now we somehow glued three of these pieces together. Yeah, so you see it's kind, kind of complicated, right? So you see, and these, these two edges are, are connected and it's kind of mess, but nevertheless, it serves its purpose and it was perfectly fine in our mm -hmm. original proof, especially because the properties of this, uh, this gadget were already known and described before. So we didn't bother to actually reinvent the wheel. And now, by the uh, Santa Maria Galvis and Woodruff, they instead did this gadget and called it a turbine. Yeah. I don't know why, but what happens here, if you look at it, actually these green edges are all glued together yeah, according to the orientation which depicted here. So for example, this and this point are the same and this and this point are the same. So you just do it like, <laughs> you can imagine it, right? <laughs> it's kind of nice. So it actually lives in three dimensional space, this one. Uh, and now here you see, here, these red edges are the things where the clauses are attached. And here, for example, if this edge is free, meaning that there's nothing grouped there, then you can go in this direction. That's okay, if you check it. And you remove all triangles here without actually creating any hole on, on, along the way, which is the thing we care about. You, I cannot simply start by removing three because then I would create additional hole, which I'm all, not allowed. And so, so I really need to start like this. Then I can pass through this triangle here and go like that over here. And finally, I managed to really remove all the triangles in this gadget. And so that's the, their simplification. Actually, we were thinking about this this the kind of square, but decided against it because you know mm -hmm. we already had to prescribe to look at this. So and now let me finish. So what are the open problems in this area? So we already know that this shellability is NP complete, but if I have this two-dimensional complex, we know that once we remove the faces, see that. We know, if we know the number of these holes, the number of faces we, we need to remove. So if we can test all possible removals, that means that, um, and then after this removal, the rest is basically linear. Yeah. That means that the shellability of two-dimensional complexes is in XP. And the question is whether it stays in FPD. And that would be the natural next question. The second thing is somehow for these formulas and things, we need it somehow to cross and to glue things not very nicely. And therefore our complex quite didn't fit into three dimensional space. Well, it, it did even didn't fit into four dimensional space. <laughs> but uh, so the question is, can we, push the dimension lower to dimension three or four or even three. And the next thing is, and that's kind of surprising. If I take a K skeleton of N simplex, that for example, mean all triangles on let's say 60 vertices. And I start shelling it, meaning gluing one, one triangle, starting with one triangle and gluing the next triangle along some edges, always along some edges. Can I get stuck? Can the algorithm get stuck producing something which cannot be extended further? 
or does the greedy algorithm always succeed? So, and provided that I really have all the all the faces, all the triangles there, or all the tetrahedra, and the Simon's conjecture is that you cannot get stuck, yeah, or that. Uh, in fancy words, that this uh, K skeleton of n simplex is extendably shallable. Yeah, but it really means the greedy algorithm doesn't get stuck. And this is known for some particular values of K and N. For example, if K is 0, 1, 2, so even triangles are nice, or if the K is N, N minus 1, and based on some unpublished result also for n equal k equals n minus two and the rest nobody knows so, so but it's nice problem to really just try for example you know pick some 60 vertices and try whether you can uh, glue these triangles together and the thing is how hard is actually to recognize three uh, balls you know we know that manifolds are shellable, but if I have some simply so complex, which is uh, homeomorphic to a ball, which can be and lives in three dimensional space, yeah, it doesn't need to be a polytope. It can be like just homeomorphic. Right? <laughs> so now, is it easy to decide whether this feature is shellable or not? Yeah, so that's really an open question and very interesting. And the next thing we were uh, talking about shellability of posets. And what is a partially ordered set? Well, I can give it, let's say, in, by terms of it, Hasse diagram. And this Hasse diagram, the simplices in my simplicial complex here, correspond to the chains in that poset. And that means their number, even the number of simplices, it can be exponential in the size of the diagram. And now, can I even then decide whether this poset is shellable or not in polynomial time? Because obviously I cannot list the ordering of the faces. Right? So, so that's another interesting question. And if it's in NP, it's obviously NP complete, right? Because so, and I guess, uh, yeah, that's all about shellability for today. And uh, thank you for your attention. So, are there any questions? So, was the dimension bound in the reduction here in your proof or in this? What? Well, in this simpler uh, what is it? so so I mean you're, okay it's related to your second bullet on this last one. Uh -huh. So okay, R C or R4 is perhaps too hard to ask for at least currently, but is that do you know the explicit some explicit bound that the known proofs provide on the dimension? Uh, for the NP completeness, uh, yes, because you know if I have triangles, if I have two-dimensional complex, then every two-dimensional simple complex can be embedded into five-dimensional space. So, uh, so five, yeah. five is for two dimensional complexes is five. And then we just increase for three dimensional, we do the cone. So that's one dimensional. Yeah, so really four would be improvement. And currently we are working on reducing the dimension a bit and also trying to understand the Simon's conjecture, which seems uh, somehow people are getting more and more interested, interested in it for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, any other questions? Uh, for example, the last, last one, this is, this is somewhat known, at least for some uh, special cases of uh, uh, posets. 
Uh, yes, uh, basically what has been done is that uh, you have some kinds of like general posets which appear in algebra and for all of them it was proven by using some notion that they are shallable. Like if you have this Bruhat order, which is basically an order which orders the permutation in cyclic group. Yeah. So you have a set of your generators and you order the um, permutations in your symmetric group according to you know how complicated words you need to produce to, to get this this permutation so this gives you a partial order and for that it has been proven that it is shallable so uh, and these are the posets people are interested in right so really something which appears in algebra and for which you need to generate proof but holding for a whole class of posets that that has been done but otherwise um, I don't think anything more than that. Is there some application to this? <laughs> that, where, where, I mean, why do they want to know if it's a uh, Well, because if, uh, well, uh, because if you have a shellable poster, that means, um, uh, how do I say this? So uh, let's say I have. Uh, some pose and yeah, some nice pose. And now, uh, for some kind of many things, I'm interested, uh, let's say, in Mabius inversion formula on this pose. Yeah, and what does it this mean? That means that um, uh, I somehow forget the bottom element. And what I'm wanting to do is to assign to each of these points a number such that if I look below, then uh, the sum of all numbers which I see together with this one is one. Yeah, so here I need to put one because here I do not have nothing. So here I have one, one, one. Yeah. And now if I look at this, guy what does it see below it are three ones so i need to put here minus two and somehow this inversion formula can be used to somehow invert functions on both sides and can be used to really produce inclusion exclusion formulas for counting and stuff like that yeah so uh, you are interested in, for example, these kinds of Mebius, the values which can appear in the Mebius function. And actually, these, these things are somehow related to the Euler characteristic of the order complex. Yeah? So, and what is the or, or, order complex here? That basically means that I remove the top and bottom element and I count and I build a simplicial complex which is formed by the chains here. Yeah, so if I would have something more complicated, like uh, if I would have, for example, this pose set, yeah, then my simplicial complex, okay, I said I remove the top and bottom element. Otherwise, the whole thing is topologically trivial because it can be contracted to that point, right? So what happens here is I have four points. Therefore, I will have four points. So my whole set will have four points here. And what will be the faces? The faces of dimension one will be chains of size one. So what is the chain? So, okay, let us label these points somewhat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So there is a chain from one to four, two. So I will draw one, two. There is a chain from three to four. So I will draw three, four. 
There is a chain for two to four. Uh, okay, let's do it. Let's do it opposite way. There is a chain from two to four. So, and there is a chain from one to three. Yeah? And now the other characteristic actually of this complex is actually is the same as the Mabius function here. Yeah. And uh, so uh, somehow this shellability tells you some properties of the uh, of the Euler characteristics and therefore some bounds for the for the Euler, for the inversion formula for inclusion exclusion and stuff like that. And that's the reason why people can why this is useful. But yeah, the construction is kind of. Okay. Any questions? Seems this is not the case, so let us thank the speaker again. <laughs> and that's it for today.